Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. America takes in more immigrants than the rest of the world combined. But legal immigration is now under serious attack. An old argument with a new face is surfacing, and it says that the new immigrants are smothering American culture. Joining us to sort through the conflict and the consensus are Peter Brimelow, author of Alien Nation, Common Sense About America's Immigration Disaster. Peter Skerry, a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center and author of Mexican Americans, The Ambivalent Minority, a prize-winning book. Linda Chavez, president of the Center for Equal Opportunity and author of Out of the Barrio, Toward a New Politics of Hispanic Assimilation. And me, as viewers of this program, of course, know I am normally the ever objective, completely impartial moderator. But I have written about this issue most recently in a book called The First Universal Nation. So this week, I am an immoderator and a semi-panelist. The topic before this house, Will Immigrants Harm America? This week on Think Tank. America is a nation of immigrants who have always wanted to pull up the gangplank behind them. During the first three decades of this century, nearly 20 million immigrants came to America. Back then, many residents feared the so-called dirty and criminal peoples of Southern and Eastern Europe would swamp America and the American culture. Fortunately for everyone involved, it seemed to have worked out rather well. These days, immigrants hail less from Europe and more from Asia and Latin America. Probably not by coincidence, the rate of Americans favoring cuts in immigration rose from under 40% in the 1950s to over 60% today. Until recently, the immigration debate was dominated by illegal immigration, estimated to be about 300,000 people per year. But today, with just over 800,000 legal immigrants entering the United States each year, some people are again worried that America is in danger of being swamped. Presidential candidate Pat Buchanan sees it this way. America needs a timeout, a period similar to the time we had between the 1920s and the 1960s, to assimilate to something like 25 million immigrants who have come in here since the 1965 legislation. I fear that with wholesale illegal immigration and unrestricted immigration otherwise, we are really in danger of losing our country. If the Others see it quite differently. Presidential candidate Phil Graham has said, quotes, I am not ready to take down the Statue of Liberty. We've got room in America, a lot of room. If we can preserve freedom, we don't ever have to worry about what America is going to look like. That's from a conservative candidate. If current trends continue, America will look quite different 50 years from now. In 1990, 76% of Americans were non-Hispanic whites, 12% were black, and only 12% were Asian or Hispanic. By the year 2050, just over half of America will be so-called Anglos. The question remains, therefore, what? All right, Peter Brimelow, uh, let's start with you and go around the horn quickly here. You have written that the United States will become a freak among nations because of the demographic mutation it is undergoing. Well, of course, that? the point about this demographic mutation, Ben, is it's entirely driven by public policy. Public policy, incidentally, which has never been voted on because people were told exactly the opposite on the 65 Act, which is what is causing this. The 1965 Immigration Act. Exactly right. Uh, and the, the, point, the other point is that immigration in the past has never worked without pauses. There was a 40-year pause in the middle of this uh, century, and that allowed the assimil assimilation to take place. Mm -hmm. There were many other pauses. And finally, of course, the, the last great wave of immigrants, they weren't Americans. 40% of them went back. They went back, basically, because they failed in the workforce. Now we have the immigration and the welfare state. We've never seen the two together. We have net immigration very high, 10%, only 10% of legal immigrants seem to go back. Uh, and uh, the result is that immigrants are disproportionately onto welfare. Okay, uh, Linda Chavez, is America about ready to become a freak among nations as you're 
colleague on the panel says? Well, Ben, I don't buy the demographic argument. Uh, it presumes, for example, that uh, Hispanics are going to continue to marry Hispanics and stay in a separate enclave, uh, living these ethnically separate lives. Uh, in fact, the data shows that about a third of young Hispanic uh, who are born here in the United States are marrying non-Hispanic whites. About half of all of the Asians in the United States marry whites. So I think that when you cite those numbers from the year 2050, it presumes that one ounce of Asian or Hispanic blood does an Asian or Hispanic forever make, and I don't buy that argument. Okay. Peter Scarry. Yes, you'd be pleased to hear, Ben, that I don't agree with either Peter or Linda quite. That's why you're here, Peter. Oh, glad <laughs> right. to be here. Right. Um, I think Peter um, ha raises some important questions about immigration that need, Im need raising, but I think he takes scintilla of evidence, of scintilla of facts, and runs much, much too far with them. Uh, I, I think we, we should be concerned about economic issues when it comes to immigration, legal immigration, but I think the evidence is not all in yet. I think we have some disturbing signs. On the other hand, um, I, th I think Linda's correct to point to assimilation as a very ongoing reality. Intermarriage rates are quite stunning. However, the American story is that assimilation creates its own discontents. Assimilation does not solve all our problems. The problems are with second and third generation immigrants, the children and grandchildren of immigrants, who face all sorts of problems about who they are. Well, not, not only second and third generation, but you look at the, uh, the diversity argument, the multicultural argument, you have in it a lot of people who are the sons and daughters and ancestors of people, wasps who came over here 200 years ago and blacks who came over here more than 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. so it's not just second and third. I mean, it's something that happens in a pluralist nation. Well, it does happen in a pluralist nation, but I think the problems of the children of immigrants in terms of the values that they, that they live by, I mean, it, it's, it, there's a human dimension to this that it's important to point out, that if you're a, a child of an immigrant, you very quickly become an American and, and, and assimilate in those terms. However, what does that tell you about your parents uh, who come here with very different values? That's a classic American tension and, 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 and tragedy in many cases. Um, and it leads in off, often cases to problems with, with peer group pressure, gang activity. That's what we saw at the turn of the century. We see it here today. And that's got to do with the, the gap between immigrant values and American values that those children have to negotiate. But, but you we see... We saw this University of Chicago study recently which said basically that immigrants, when they come in, do well in schools. Mm -hmm. But after that, they seem to sort of assimilate to the American pattern so that you get the blacks going into assimilating at the black American, American pattern and, and Asian students not working as hard. There you yeah, go again, you, Peter. It, you, there's, there's one study that points I to that. I support you. There's, well, there's a, but, but you see, you go too far. I mean, I think there's reasons to be concerned about this, this gap uh, that I point to. But the study you're talking about with Mexican Americans looks at one school in Oxnard or some coastal community that no, has strong just, agricultural. It was, it was a university and, and, and what did it just hold on a second? Please. What did that study show? And it shows that there's a tendency uh, among ch young Mexican Americans to define themselves as Chicanos, to get you know to be cool, as not to do well in school. Um, many of the problems we've seen with inner city blacks. I think there's reason to be concerned, but to characterize the entire second generation that way, that all children of immigrants... I, I don't want to embarrass Peter, but I, I think I'll just stop agreeing with you. Peter, let, uh, that's a deal. Let me <laughs> that's, that's the good news. Yeah, let, go ahead. Let me interject right. here because I think there are some, some problems that we have to deal with in terms of assimilation and some problems in terms of public policy. My concern is not that the Asians and Latins that are coming here don't want to be American or that they don't want to learn English, that they're not going to do well economically in this society. I think the evidence suggests that they will do comparably well to other groups who came before. I think the problem is we do have a lot of public policies in place that are problematic. You've pointed to the welfare state. Peter, you've written in, in your work, as have I, about affirmative action. These are problems. We now live in a regime in which, because of civil rights laws, we now yeah. give preference on this the basis of race different. and ethnicity. Completely different and, what's and, happened in 1900. And, and that is very different. Yeah. And I'm concerned about that. But quite frankly, you could shut off the border. You could put up a Berlin Wall at our southern border, as far as I'm concerned. We would still have the problems with affirmative action and bilingual education in the schools and multiculturalism in, yes, in the schools. But the constituencies, and we need to deal with but that the constituencies, separately. The constituencies will not be as strong. And it won't be being reinforced no, by... They'd still be 20% of Americans. Peter, you, 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 you seem to think that the son or daughter of a Korean inner city granddaughter, uh, of a green grocer, grocer, yeah. a green grocer right, you heard that line of mine, mm. is somehow leading the barricades uh, in multiculturalism and diversity and affirmative action. That's just not true. 
and, and, and know, neither actually, are, course, are most Hispanic immigrants. Right now, we don't know how the Asians are going to go. You do see some sign of, of, of Asian. There are some Asian radicals around. Well, there are but, some. Uh, there are some wasp radicals who have very old New England names. But the fundamental Peter. point. I mean, they're well, people. Right? I realize that you don't want to talk about economics in this show. But the fundamental point about about well, well, what did about you say economics. About this show? I realize Sorry. you don't want to talk about economics in this show. But there is Go a ahead, be my guest. Well, there's a fundamental point here, which is that immi this immigration you can't show that it in any way is necessary to the U.S. That's what the economic evidence is. The, the, the benefit from this immigration is very slight. It's probably wiped out by the welfare loss. So you have to make a political case for this immigration, and nobody's making it. I and mean, why take the risk is the point. Maybe Linda's right. I think the, de the data is more fragmented than, 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 than she says here. And I know that she said to me before that this is nothing that bad policies can't mess up, this assimilation policy. That's right. That's maybe uh, maybe she's right. Maybe they will assimilate. But why take the risk? That's the point. Peter, you're being disingenuous. Your, your book is schizophrenic. You, you did an enormous service by cutting through a lot of rhetoric some of which emanates from, from, from Ben and, and, and people who, who, who have that perspective on immigration. Don't frighten him. But, but that's fine. You cut through a lot of rhetoric and you make, and you elucidate a lot of economic evidence that I think is important and, and, and compelling. But then there's the other part of your book where you have this, this, this cultural racial argument that doesn't, that doesn't articulate with that at all and that says things like when, when, you, when you go below the street in New York City into the subway or into the INS office, you're faced with a third world, you know, a set of th let third me, world let faces. Me, let me read one more and then let's move on. Uh, Brimelow reports that when you uh, enter the waiting room at an office of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, quotes, you find yourself in an underworld that is not just teeming, but is almost entirely colored. Now, this is no more or less than the absolute truth, and it speaks to the way the 65 actors yep. work. And it speaks right, to right. Your this let me finish. Argument. Let me finish. It's choked off immigration from Europe. It's skewed immigration towards just 15 countries from the, from the third world. This is a fact. If you don't right. like the fact, go and argue no, the, go I, and argue I, the, the it, politicians. It, but it's no more or less. It than is the fact. a fact. We, we've shown it in, in the setup piece. But the question is, what is the consequence? You are saying that that, that uh, the people who don't come from Europe. Uh, are culturally incompatible in this society. Now, how do you know that? Why do you think that? Uh, you, you look at the Asian immigration, for, the, uh, for example. I mean, they're winning Nobel Prizes for us. They're developing uh, medicines to, 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 to cure osteoporosis. I mean, I, uh, you are an immigrant. I, are you more of an American than Michael Chang? You know, the point you is don't that play tennis you know, the, well the reason why you can't, the reason why you can't finish the rest of that story. Why can't we talk about Vietnamese gangs? Why can't we talk about Peter, cri cri criminal, criminal elements with Peter, them? I ought to finish. The other point is that what you're talking about there is the consequence of skilled immigration. And the fact is that the 65 Act has, has choked off skilled immigration because of the way the family unification principle works, which is why we now have immigrants on balance less skilled. You could have a million immigrants a year, but why not skilled immigrants? Why have they got to half well, of them talk, unskilled? Let, let's uh, talk about skilled immigrants. Let, let, let me bring this back because I think, th I think there's an important point here, and this is what some of us find frustrating in your book, Peter, is that on the one hand, you argue for more skilled immigration, which I think all of us, I mean, I've written about that in commentary myself. I think we ought to have a more skills-based immigration policy. I think family reunification does not necessarily make sense. But if we had a skill-based immigration, the likelihood is it would be very heavily skewed from Asia. In fact, they would be non-white immigrants from India, from Pakistan, and from other parts of Asia. Now, if your argument is fundamentally a racial argument or even a cultural argument, how is it that you justify that at the same time as you say you want more skilled immigrants? Because the most skilled people who are coming to the United States today are coming from third world, non-white nations. I don't understand your point. I, I, I say that I, would, I think skilled Im immigrants on the whole do better, uh, preferable to unskilled immigrants. How, uh, you know, if, they're, if they're skilled, then I would be much less worried. And, and yeah. if, in fact, we were admitting all of the immigrants from Asia as opposed to Latin America, so your real objection is really not about skills, it's really not about race, your real objection is to unskilled Latin immigrants coming to the United States. It's unskilled immigrants. I, I wonder what the point of having unskilled immigrants is. I don't, you know, you, the, the evidence is One that you One of the can, points of having them is that they do jobs that the rest of us won't do oh, anymore, Oh, baloney. It's, it's just a myth. What do you think happens in Japan? But they, just, they get they get the they're uh, bringing in illegals to do they have they're bringing in illegals to do the jobs they, that Japanese they throw won't them out, do. Out, as out as fast as they can. They have maybe two hundred thousand illegals in the country, and they throw them out as fast as they can. We have well, at least and, four and, and a half million and, and illegals. And they also in this have a class system uh, in Japan and, that, that and they're not that, even efficient forces, about their use of labor. That forces back. people into to stay into lower class jobs and hovels 
from which they cannot rise. That is not the American tradition. It's uh, just, just, just nonsense. I mean, it's not just it's, nonsense. It's, ob it's, it's obvious. It's, it's, it's I thought you were going to say Peter. The there's a caste system just in Japan. Just do not need Peter, this kind of cheap labor. Peter, I thought you were going to say. Substitute, I, you, can, you can substitute capital for labor. You can substitute robotics for labor. And that's what the Japanese I have done. I thought what you were going to say is that we could have a guest worker type program. Well, that's, that's true. where we could get our skilled workers from. And this is where Linda and I agree. You see, I think the basic point is the 65 system is broken. It doesn't work. Okay. Well, I think a lot of and us I think agree. everybody here agrees with I that. I think a lot Don't of us, a yeah. lot of us agree oh. that the 1965 uh, immigration law has some problems, and in point of fact, the last immigration law in 1990 does uh, starkly increase the number of skilled workers. It makes a uh, large effort to rebalance the immigration through these so-called diversity immigrants, which are supposed to come largely from Europe. So, you know, all your points I, are not off the wall. I would be the first uh, to. to um, uh, to allow that. Second. Let me ask you a question, though. You say, well, all I really want is a lull, just a, morator just a little plain moratorium for five years. Can you, and one of the candidates who says that he wants that and sort of leading the movement is my good friend Patrick J. Buchanan, can you, in your wildest imagination, it's 1995, the year 2000, can you see Pat Buchanan sta standing up and saying, the lull is over, and now let's start taking all those people back in. Do you, do you if, seriously if, if, believe that as if, a political idea? If there were Croatians, you might well do. But yeah. in fact, yeah. I mean, the, the issue is what the Americans want. That's the fundamental issue here. You know, for, for more than 40 years, as you know, not more than 13% of Americans, 1-3% of Americans have said that they wanted to see immigration increase, but it's been quintupled. That looks great from here inside the Beltway, but out there in the country, it gets people very upset. You can't do that kind of thing to a country without expecting serious reaction. But you Ultimately, there's a value judgment here. People have to make a value judgment. Do they want to have 390 million people living here, which is what the Census Bureau says will happen in 2050 with, the, with current immigration flow, or do they want 250 million people, which is what the Census Bureau would happen, says would happen without immigration? It's a value judgment and it's up to the Americans to make it. So I, I say in five years' time, let's ask the Americans. But if you're concerned about reactions, Peter, the kinds of proposals that you put forward will create incredible reactions of their own. The kind of, you know, the ditch or, or barriers or whatever it is you say we should, American political will should muster up at the border, or an operation wetback that you, that you, you know, unshamefacedly uh, put forward will create such division in the American mm -hmm. Southwest that, I mean, we, you know, we wouldn't be able to have a program like this to talk about it. Um, the well, what you're saying, Peter, if, if, if we can't have an Operation Wetback, which, as you know, Ben, was, was the way in which the Eisenhower administration ended the last illegal immigration crisis, and it deported about a million... Yeah, but you're talking uh, about illegal immigration. Listen, Wait if you can't have an Operation Wetback, which is what Peter raised it, yeah, what, yeah. what you said, what you said is if you can't have an Operation Wetback, the U.S. has lost control of its national yeah, well, territory. No, 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 no. Well, they're already eager. Right, let let, 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 let me talk. also interject right. here that in Operation Wetback, mm. there were thousands of people who looked like me and like me were born in the United States and whose parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were born here who were deported to Mexico and had to fight to get back in, who had to prove themselves. I, I mean, I, that Linda, my impression is that most of the American citizens who were deported were actually children because they their children were born here and become children by vote, uh, citizens by vote. I don't, the think that's, I don't think that's true. I mean, you may, you, I don't know what the numbers are, but I know that, in fact, there were a number of people who were deported can, can who had a legal right stop, to be here. Stop for a minute. The, the purpose of, of this discussion, uh, I thought, was to try to deal with legal immigration because I think everyone at this panel and most everyone in America America is agreed that we have to stop illegal immigration. But not deport illegals. That's the I, excuse me? They no, don't I, want to deport the illegals. I, I, I don't already. think Linda's against no, deporting I'm, I'm illegals. No, I'm absolutely in favor, but I'm not in favor of the kind of roundups that took place. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I, think it's, I think it's a balancing act. So it's a balancing act, and I don't think it's worth it. You're talking about four million people. I mean, obviously, you're going to have to, uh, you, uh, you know, there's four million illegals here. Should they stay here? Look, Should they be I, forcibly deported? I, I, think I, I don't think we want to send troops out into uh, the southwestern let's United ha, let's States. Let's have a vote on it. <laughs> uh, Linda, l l let me ask you a question. Uh, Peter mentioned the, uh, uh, that the current crop of immigrants uh, are more likely to be on welfare and generally are more likely to be ne'er-do-wells than in that, those halcyon days of yore. Uh, do you buy that? Or what, well, first what, of all, what, we didn't have welfare pro uh, right. programs in those halcyon days but what, of yours. What are so. the immigrants like today? 
it depends on who you're talking about. If you're talking about working age immigrants, they are less likely to be on welfare than the U.S. born. If you are talking about refugees, it is U.S. policy to admit refugees and to put them on welfare. I think that policy is wrong. I think it ought to be changed. I think it's a disgrace. I think the American taxpayers don't support it. I'd like to see changes in that law. If you're talking about uh, older immigrants, uh, I think there also we have a problem. I think there are a lot of people who are sponsoring their parents and bringing them here and then not, and then not taking care right. of them. We have laws adequate on the book now to deal with that. Those laws ought to be enforced. I think they ought to be expanded. I think that people who sponsor someone to come into the United States ought to be responsible for a minimum of 10 years mm -hmm. for the financial well-being of that family. And if they turn out to be wards uh, of the state, then I think they ought to be sent back. But of course we already have these laws on the of books. Of course we do. Stand, and we're not enforcing them. Mm -hmm. And that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And we ought to be hammering at the Clinton administration to begin to enforce those so laws. We, we, and also for that matter, the Reagan-Bush administration. And the Reagan-Bush administration Peter, as well. Peter Skerry, because you've written about this. Are immigrants and the current pattern of immigration behind this multicultural agenda, this diversity mongering that is good up to a certain point and then beyond that, in my judgment, leans toward separatism? Well, the phrasing, are, are they behind it, I find a little unfortunate, but I, I, I take your meaning, Ben. Um, I think they play Everyone's an important... correcting you today. Go ahead, please. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, these are touchy issues. Um, um, I, I think, I think that the, the much, if not most, of the impetus behind multiculturalism, to use that phrase, I think, in fact, comes from black Americans. Yet, I think many immigrants and, and certainly many immigrant leaders partake of that. And I think it speaks back to the point I made at the beginning of the program. It speaks to the whole ordeal, the storm and drong of assimilation. Um, finding out, if, if, I think the problem today in America, as much as anything, is not a lack of assimilation. It's almost too much assimilation. It's, it's, it's excessive assimilation. The young Mexican-Americans I meet in Los Angeles, in, in East Los Angeles, um, don't suffer from lack of it. They, they feel deracinated. They, don't, they can't speak Spanish to their, to, to their grandmothers who don't speak English. They don't know anything about their culture or their heritage, they'll tell you. That's hard to believe in East Los Angeles, but that's what one hears over and over again, and that's borne out by, by how, the data. And, and how is that different than what Nat Glazer and it's uh, not, that's Moynihan the, are, that's were writing about in, 19, in the 1970s, uh, uh, about, about Eastern and, and Southern About Europeans. Italians and right. Jews and Poles, and, and, and in an earlier era about Germans. I mean, that, and, that and, is, and that's exactly the case. You, let me answer the question. It's, it's, it's very much the same, except it's arguably more deracinating today, I think because of mass media and the popular so, culture. It, it tell us what deracinating means. It means uprooted. It means deprived of your roots, okay. literally, from the Latin. Okay, I sh but we're right. not speaking Latin. Right. But the, the, the point I would make is that it's, it is essentially the same process, yet today we have a totally different infrastructure in place that, that, that's, that speaks to and evokes those feelings. The political institutions in particular of affirmative action, the Voting Rights Act, and, and a broader set of cultural norms that, that evoke uh, the, 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 those kinds of reactions and that feed on them and exacerbate and them. And that is precisely the point, and we need to do something about those policies. Affirmative action is a bad idea. Again, if we closed the border, if we didn't let in another Mexican or another Asian uh, immigrant, we'd still have but a problem But it isn't that of simple, I would argue, because what we had in place at the turn of the century when Nat Glazer and so forth were going through those pains were a whole set of political Nat institutions. Nat is not that old. You're no, talking you're about right. what he was writing about. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, okay. You're that old. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you. Right. No, you're, neither I'm, of you. I'm, I'm under 100. Go neither ahead. of you are that right. old. It, right. You know, anything above I'm 50 looks old Don't to me. Don't make that one. Um, um, what we had in place were a set of political institutions, local, local political organizations, the so-called political machines, that I think, and, and they're not just that, but principally that, played an important role in helping bridging these kinds of, these, these kinds of anxieties and help provided a path into the broader stream of American society. We don't have any of that, P Peter, and if we get rid of affirmative action Peter, today, we still won't have it. You wouldn't have disagreed with this recent conversation, would you have much? Oh, sure, he's right. But I don't want to agree with Peter because it embarrasses him. I mean, he has to work in academic life, you know. <laughs> Peter, um, I don't, you don't, we don't have to work at it. You, you're, you know, we talk about irresponsible. The kind of things you say about race and culture uh, are, you know, suggesting an Operation Wetback 
are incredibly divisive and not very helpful to Peter, your argument, it seems to no, me. Nobody on this show has been called a racist more times than I have, so let's not, you know, let, let's not try to I don't know. I've, been, I've, I've, I've gone through I, that. I guess maybe right. I've been exposed too much to George Orwell as an adolescent, you know. I, I really do believe in plain speaking in, in, politi in political discourse. I think that uh, at the moment we have a, a political discourse which is, is impossibly uh, corrupted and, and, and riddled with taboos, and as a result... Did, did, this, did, that's uh, why it's did, disappointing did, to hear did, you back did, off did the you argument find, in your book. Did you find any taboos in this discussion? And oh, if, we're, so, we're, if so, what are they? Well, we're very enlightened, aren't we? No, no, no. Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm just <laughs> well, curious. I think, I what think were the taboos? Well, we, we think, can talk about them. I think Peter is disturbed about the idea of, uh, of an Operation Wetback, I think, uh, and I think his, dis his, his distress is, is essentially emotional. And if I may say so, irrational, because uh, there's no other way to resolve the problem if they have a large illegal population. All right, listen, we, we are uh, about out of time. I want to go uh, once around the room, starting with you, Peter, brief answer uh, to this question. Uh, is it going to work out all right? We don't know yet. I think there are lots of reasons to be concerned. Linda? I think it's likely to work out all right, but I think we do have to meet, uh, have some changes in public policy. People need to learn English, and they do need to assimilate. I don't, I don't know whether it's going to work out, but I say why take the risk? Uh, I think there's more of a risk uh, in not trying. Uh, okay, thank you, Linda Chavez, Peter Brimelow, and Peter Skerry. And thank you. Please send your comments and questions to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Or we can be reached by email at thinktv at aol.com. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media which are solely responsible for its content.